The hypersonic era is reshaping how nations think about deterrence, response time, and national defense. For Australia, a country bridging the Indo-Pacific's most volatile strategic theater, the question is no longer if hypersonic weapons will redefine warfare, but whether Canberra can adapt fast enough to remain credible within it. The Sea Fire Program, a joint Australian-American effort to develop air-launched hypersonic cruise missiles, represents not only a technological leap, but a shift in strategic posture. It is the first clear signal that Australia intends to move from a purely defensive mindset toward deterrence by denial, the ability to strike swiftly, precisely, and independently across vast distances. At its core, a hypersonic weapon travels at more than Mach 5, meaning it can cross 1,000 kilometers in under 10 minutes. Unlike ballistic missiles that soar into space and descend along predictable arcs, hypersonic glide vehicles and scramjet-powered cruise missiles fly within the upper atmosphere, maneuvering unpredictably and evading most radar coverage. The United States, China, and Russia have all demonstrated prototypes. But what makes SIFIRE unique is its industrial and strategic context. It seeks to develop an allied, modular weapon that can be integrated into aircraft such as the F-35A and F-A-18F. In other words, it will extend Australia's strike reach far beyond its shoreline without violating the spirit of its non-nuclear defense doctrine. Technologically, SIFIRE builds on decades of research into scramjet propulsion by both the U.S. Air Force and Australia's DST group. The principle is elegantly brutal. At Mach 5 to 8, the missile uses its own supersonic airflow as oxidizer, compressing incoming air to sustain combustion without heavy onboard oxygen tanks. That efficiency allows greater range, higher speed, and smaller radar signatures. But the engineering challenges are immense. Sustaining structural integrity at temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Celsius, ensuring guidance precision under plasma interference, and designing a modular airframe that can survive multiple G-forces are all hurdles still being solved through extensive testing at Woomera and other facilities across northern Australia. Strategically, the implications are profound. For decades, Australia relied on geography, a tyranny of distance, as natural defense. Its military investments favored surveillance, submarines, and coalition interoperability under U.S. protection. Hypersonics disrupt this equation. They compress time, erase distance, and demand an entirely new logic of deterrence. Canberra's 2024 Defence Strategic Review openly acknowledges this reality. Australia must develop the ability to project power far beyond its borders, not just react to threats that reach them. Hypersonic capability, when integrated with the AUKUS technology ecosystem, provides precisely that tool. Yet deterrence through speed is double-edged. Hypersonics shorten decision windows to minutes, leaving commanders little time to verify, deliberate, or communicate. That speed, while tactically seductive, carries strategic risk. A radar anomaly could trigger misinterpretation and escalation. Therefore, the debate in Canberra is not whether to pursue hypersonics, that decision is made, but how to balance offensive strike potential with defensive resilience and command discipline. The solution lies in a multi-layered system, space-based sensors, over-the-horizon radars, rapid data fusion, and automated intercept planning, 
all coordinated through the C5ISR architecture that Australia is quietly building with the US and Japan. Another pressing issue is industrial sovereignty. Hypersonic systems demand materials, testing ranges, and computing infrastructure that few nations possess. Australia's defence industry, while capable, is not yet mature enough to mass-produce scramjet vehicles or advanced thermal composites. The Skiffire model, joint design, shared intellectual property, and eventual domestic assembly, offers a balanced path. It ensures technological transfer while embedding Australian scientists and engineers within a global supply chain resilient to disruption. For a nation determined to secure its defence autonomy, this is a step toward strategic adulthood. Beyond the laboratory, however, the regional consequences will be immediate. China's DFZF glide vehicles and Russia's Kinzhal missiles have already shifted global perceptions of vulnerability. If Australia joins the hypersonic club, Beijing will almost certainly interpret it as reinforcement of the AUKUS containment arc. That perception may trigger counter-deployments, including anti-satellite systems and expanded naval presence in the South Pacific. Canberra will need diplomatic finesse to signal that hypersonics serve regional stability, not escalation, a deterrent of denial, not provocation. Its messaging must emphasize transparency, testing cooperation, and adherence to international law. Ethically, too, hypersonics blur boundaries. Their precision and speed promise to minimize collateral damage, yet their unpredictability in flight can complicate targeting verification. The absence of a global treaty regulating such weapons leaves an arms control vacuum reminiscent of the early nuclear age. Australia, with its tradition of normative diplomacy, could leverage ski fire not only as a military project, but as a platform to promote multilateral frameworks on transparency, testing limits, and notification standards. This would convert a cutting-edge weapon into an instrument of strategic legitimacy. The central question remains, can Australia deter through technology alone? The answer likely is no. Deterrence requires credibility, resilience, and perception management, not merely possession of an advanced missile. Hypersonic programs such as SIFIRE can enhance credibility, but without robust command structures, secure communications, and allied integration, their deterrent effect will remain theoretical. Canberra must therefore pursue a twin track, operational mastery of hypersonic offense and the creation of a comprehensive defense ecosystem capable of tracking, intercepting, or mitigating similar weapons used by others. In essence, Seafire is not just about building a missile. It is about redefining how Australia perceives time, distance, and security in the Indo-Pacific century. The partnership with the United States is both an accelerator and a test of trust, of capability, and of strategic maturity. Success will not be measured solely by the speed of the missile but by the speed at which Canberra can adapt its doctrine, industry, and diplomacy to the realities it unleashes. Hypersonics promise no easy victories, only faster consequences. And in that unforgiving timeline, Australia must decide whether it will merely keep up or lead. <laughs>